Exactly. Jonathan Loesberg, you mentioned that uh, Bronte sends her a heroine to what we assume is Brussels, Belgium. Why doesn't she say that? <laughs> Why does she give Brussels this fictional name? I, I did not understand that. I, I, I actually don't have an idea. Uh, it, conceivably, it has to do with the fact that she, I mean, there is a biographical background. She taught in Brussels and fell in love with uh, the, uh, the married uh, schoolmaster uh, on whom people say uh, Paul Emanuel is based. So she may have felt that she was veiling that, but I, I don't think that's a good explanation. Here's an email from Lara who says... Please address the novel's very honest and bleak portrayal of Lucy's depression. I was struck particularly by her refusal to describe in precise detail the most difficult incidents of her life, including the presumed death of her parents and, of course, the loss that closes the novel. The absence of these scenes seems all the more poignant considering when Charlotte Bronte wrote the novel after the deaths of Bramwell, Emily, and Anne. I have to agree with many of the scholars mentioned at the beginning of the show, Villette blows Jane Eyre out of the water. Susan. Um, well, I, I think it's true that... Um uh, Bronte's representation of extreme emotional states and, and strange um, sort of inner dramas is is really unprecedented. And so we have the opium trip, and we have this nervous collapse after the long vacation, um, and, and we have mm-hmm. clearly this um, sinking of spirits, um, this hypochondria that we would call depression, um, and uh, and grieving. Um, and, and terror, too, and, and being haunted um, by her past um, and, and by repressed feelings. So I, I think, you know, Bronte is sometimes seen as writing in a, a sort of proto-Freudian manner. Um, she's very conscious of the effect of, um, uh, well, trauma and um, the resulting repression and then inevitably the return of repressed material um, so that's really something that, that Lucy is having to do, is to sort of work through um, these these things that the the reader is, or the emailer is quite right, um, are not fully represented or only sort of metaphorically represented. What's interesting to me is that uh, this is the first reader's review I think I've ever done where at the 20 break we have no callers. Does that mean to you that Villette is hardly a known Bronte novel. Amanda. Well, I think that it is absolutely an (laughs) underread Bronte novel, one that is more widely known um, among academics who are always seeking new ground (laughs) with with, um, known authors. And especially with the Brontes. Right, right. Um, but I would expect that many of your listeners will have at least heard of it, and some will have read it. I mean, perhaps these. Statistics. I had not heard of it uh-huh. until we did our last reader's review, when Villette was referred to a number of times, and that was why we decided to go with this. It was, uh, I'll get the name of the book we did last month, Um, it was the book club, a summer's book club, something like that. And uh, the protagonist focused on the novel, Villette. And so we thought, we've never read that. Let's do it. Amanda Anderson, one of the first prejudices that really leaps off the page is Lucy's disdain for all things Catholic. Is that something that uh, most of Charlotte Bronte's readers would have connected with? Yes. I mean, I think there was longstanding uh, political and cultural rivalry with France, um, and that often, you know, found voice in anti-Catholicism. So I think that uh, readers would very much recognize the kinds of... um, 
oppositions that she's trying to invoke and underscore in in juxtaposing her non sect her crucially non sectarian Protestantism with this Jesuitical Catholicism and the spying and the forms of external control that it seems invested in so there's a this notion that the British national character is one dedicated to liberty and inward examination associated with Protestantism would be one that that readers would really connect with and Jonathan how did you react to her take on Catholicism well I think Amanda's right in certain ways it's standard 19th century prejudices I was struck rereading the novel this time I had somehow blocked it out how ever present the spying and the surveillance is and that that was made part of Catholicism I and that really interested me because I that does not to my knowledge show up standardly in other Victorian novels Susan I actually I mean I agree with Jonathan and Amanda that certainly anti-catholic feeling on the part of the British novel and the British people is is available I think it also gives Bronte the figure of the nun in the convent the woman who's buried alive and obviously that's a faith that threatens and even tempts Lucy so part of her job is to free that nun from her entombment and it turns out it's not a nun at all to see it as a phantom or something that can be demystified in some way but I also think that in some ways it's less about a sort of brief for Protestantism per se than the way that functions in this context because it allows Lucy to sort of be a rebel and resist conversion because she's eccentric because that's how you know les anglaise are or she can be proud because she's a Protestant so it sort of becomes a language for her actually insisting upon her marginality in a way that gives her more room to maneuver I thought that scene and you referred to it earlier Jonathan when Madame Beck examines every piece of Lucy's clothing as she arrives at the school now we have to understand Lucy is a stranger Madame Beck takes her in but can we assume that Madame Beck treats all people who come into her school that way she even takes a wax impression of Lucy's key Susan I think that we're given to believe that she does she leaves nothing untouched she polices her own children and I think it is part of a representation of institutional surveillance that is partially linked to Catholicism at the same time like most of the figures in this book I think Madame Beck is she's not just an evil character and certainly she becomes well at several points in relation to Dr. John she's a love rival and then later she's a rival for Monsieur Paul and again the surveillance aspect is is certainly a creepy one but she also is someone that Lucy partially admires for her incredible capability and she's a kind of model when Lucy imagines owning her own school and starting very modestly she says well that's where Madame Beck started and now look at you know she has all these students and all this property she says that she should have swayed a nation so I do think that this book is partly about female ambition and Lucy claiming her ambitiousness and Madame Beck is in part a positive model as well as obviously in most ways an anti-model Lucy claiming her ambitiousness behind this veil of what looks like depression repression fear I mean it's such a juxtaposition that she seems to present Amanda it's interesting too that she her her standard reaction to the many characters she engages is ambivalence so that she is drawn to Madame Beck she is like Madame Beck she is a self she's a self-effacing observer Madame Beck is a cloaked surveillor there's not that much difference in some ways between the two and she needs that to engage in that kind of observation to be a narrator 